will, turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12, I'm going to be reading from verse 13 through verse 21 of Luke chapter 12. Verse 13 through verse 21. Now what we've been looking at, and we will be looking at for the next several weeks, is Jesus' teachings which are meant to correct us. Now, Scripture says that God's Word is profitable for teaching, correcting, rebuking, and training in righteousness. And that's what we want to look at. How do Jesus' words challenge us today? I want you to think about something as we approach this text this morning. Let's just say in the future, hundreds of years from now, historians go back and they look at what's going on in late 20th century, early 21st century America. What are they going to be looking at? What are they going to be saying about us? And what they're going to look at is what we build. They're going to notice two things, because you can tell a lot about a society by their biggest buildings. What do you think it's going to be? Sports stadiums <laughs> and businesses skyscrapers, because what's important to Americans? Sports, money. That's what they're going to look at. And, and today, Jesus confronts us about what we value in life. Money. Let's give attention to God's Word. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance of and he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbiter over you? And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I will do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones, and there I will store all my grains and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods to lay up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool, Tonight, your soul is required of you, and the things that you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasures for himself, and is not rich towards God. Let's pray and ask God's blessings on his word. Oh Lord, our God, correct us in our thinking and in our lives overall. Because as the hymn says, our hearts wander, they go astray, to bring us back to you and help us to see what should be the most important thing in our lives and what it means to be truly rich in you. Be with God's people as they listen to you this morning. <laughs> May your word teach them, correct them, rebuke them, and train them in righteousness. Makes for your name. Amen. Now, sometimes when we read the Bible, what we want is to be comforted by God's word. On the other hand, sometimes God's word confronts us. Uh, the problem is, though, that we often look for those words of, of comfort, those words that will confirm us. Now this week, I was listening to a sermon by a former Florida State University professor who's in the Presbyterian Church, U.S. And I was listening to this, and first of all, I was scratching my head saying, what is this sermon? But 
predispositions and the church's liberal predispositions that he was in. There wasn't a lot of congregation from the Bible. In fact, he ended it with, well, the Holy Spirit is a woman. Something along those lines. <laughs> now, on one hand, we can laugh at our liberal fellow church people, but conservatives can do the same thing, too. We can only have sermons that lift up our middle class lifestyles. But that's not what God wants either. And what we have to understand is we are sinful human beings. God's word will confront all of us at one time or another. Our hearts are idol factories. And we are sinners. And for our own good, so that we can become more like Jesus, his word must confront us. It must challenge us from everything to sexuality to salvation, from beliefs to feelings, from our intellect to our emotions. So the idols of our heart will not rule us. Instead, we will be ruled by King Jesus. Today, what do we hear? What do we see? What are the idols of our heart that God's word must confront us with? And one of them is, is the good life. The life that wealth can bring us. And let's be honest. From past generations, most of us live like kings. We truly are well off compared to the rest of the world. And today, Jesus is going to tell us a story about another man who was extremely well off. And this passage of scripture starts with a confrontation that moves to a story to help us clarify what Jesus is saying not only to those first century Jews, but to us as well. And let's begin with that confrontation. Now out of the crowd that Jesus is teaching, there is a man who comes to him and says to Jesus, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now in one sense, what he is asking was quite common for a rabbi back then to decide. But this man is demanding. But Jesus looks deeper into his soul than the mere request. He goes deep into his heart, just like he did with the wealthy young ruler who came and said, what must I do right here? Eternal life. He goes deep. And Jesus says to him, that's how he puts them off. Man, who may be a judge or arbiter over you? <coughs> Jesus says, I'm not getting into this. And the reason he's not getting into this is because there's a deeper issue than just merely dividing up an estate. And this should challenge us right here, because notice here, Jesus does not answer every question, and we got a lot of questions we probably have, and Jesus says, sorry, you don't get an answer now. But the real issue of this man's heart is not an inheritance of his brother. He is greedy. And notice what Jesus says about this man. Life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Take care. Be on your guard against all types of covetousness. <laughs> he is saying that man's real problem is covetousness. It's greed. Lust for more stuff. And over-desire for goods and things. You want it too much. Now, let's be honest. The Bible is not against material possessions. You cannot escape from reading the Bible and seeing that God does bless people with temporal gifts, such as land, bones, and abundant crop. Look at what he did to Solomon. He blessed him physically with all types of good 
and there are plenty of poor people who can be greedy just as much as a rich person can. So the problem is not with money. The problem is with focus. Focusing too much on something. It is where everything revolves around possessions and goods and money. So much so that you can become jealous of another person if they have something that you want. And that dominates our society today, doesn't it? But I want you to think for a moment. Think how this might play out in things. <clears throat> Let's just say there's a, a young boy. He is growing up in an upper, upper middle class home. His father is a successful business. And his father has dedicated all his life to being successful. It is the only thing he is interested in. And the son is seeing his father take shortcuts. He has heard his father in his remarks about paying taxes, and his father finds every way, legal and illegal, to get out of paying taxes. The father's wife is just there, no relationship. And soon that boy gets ready to graduate high school. And the father tells his son, go out, make a million dollars, no matter what. And guess what the kid does? He grows up with exactly that type of mindset, cheating his way into the school, marrying a trophy wife, which he really doesn't like, but simply because he can show her off at a meeting and everybody's going to go, oh, he must be successful. He has no time in his life for a church, for kids, for anything else. He is dominated by that pursuit of wealth and of pleasure with no thought. Or of spirituality. In the Bible, there is another example of this. Abraham. God's people were going into the promised land. They were there to conquer. And God told them, now you're going to go into the Holy Land, there are going to be these cities there, and they're going to have lots of wealth. You are not to take their wealth. You give it to God. This is not a conquest for goods. It is a conquest to go in and establish the Holy Land. So what does Achan do? In the invasion, he comes in and sees a nice robe, silver and gold. Despite what God said, he takes it and buries it. And God's people are defeated because Achan was greedy and covetous and disobeyed God's word. It's that greed. It's that type of thinking. Cloud the mind. Is wealth wrong? No. But it can become the focus of a life, and that's not what God wants. It is no wonder Paul says, put to death what is earthly in you. Covetousness. In 1 Timothy 6 9, it says in Scripture, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a stare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. And I wonder if making it in life is your sole desire, how many people like that have turned and ruined their lives? Here's what we got to think about. Being close to wealth, but you may be far from God. Because that wealth can become too much for most of us. And you know, maybe it's a blessing we are not super wealthy. <laughs> maybe it's a blessing that we are not living somewhere in those nice sections of Perdido Cave. Maybe it's a blessing we live in 80 point. Because I got a feeling it would become too much for us. And here's the test whether you are heading in that direction. What do you think about all the time? What do you think about? When you have nothing to do and there's nothing on TV, what do you think about? If you're the type of person who is only thinking about how can I make some more money? How can I make some how can I get how can I get a bigger house? How can I get a better home? You may have a problem. How do you feel about giving? Giving to the church. There are people who think, no, you should give to the church. 
Some people may say they need to get a job, and there are swindlers out there. There are. Still, those who are truly poor need our help. Now, we need to be wise about how we do it, but how many of us always feel a little hesitant? Oh, I do. I do. Because they can take advantage of it, but still, there's a command on what we need to do. And let's also remember that in all the history of the world, when we compare ourselves to other generations, we are extremely Now. Nah. 
budget so they can survive and have money in the bank. And it goes on and on and on until they get right here. And now they're on the way. They're seeing the world. They have focused on saving that money, having wealth, so they reach those happy golden years where they don't have any worries and no problems. And you know what Jesus would say? You're being foolish. Why are you being foolish? Because you have spent all that time and all that concern. What about your soul? What about the church? What about giving to other people? And that's what we've got to think about as well. Because if the focus of our life is simply those happy golden years, living in the housing development as they said in Seinfeld, Del Boca Vista number two, going out and getting an early bird special for dinner at a cheap price, and living near the beach with a swimming pool, with the plastic floating that's around, and we think that's all there is to life, and we miss the point. And we are in danger. Is having goods a problem? No. But it is when it becomes the focus of life. Instead, what we need to really be focusing on is preparing for that future. Oh, yes, you should be doing that. Yes, you should be taking care of it if you've got some good savings. But don't forget that there is a life to come. And what you need to be rich in is the kingdom of God. And how do we become rich? By helping the church out with those tithes and offerings. It's by helping the poor. And you know, a lot of our wealth that we have, it's like when my, my granddaughter comes over and we have a penny jar. And she's got to get her hands in those pennies. And they wind up all over the floor because they just fall through her hands. That's what a lot of our material possessions might do, just fall through her hands. Somebody else has been yelling. Being rich towards God means giving. And what's most important is having Jesus Christ. Because what does Scripture say? Oh, we read it this morning. We read it in the response of reading from 2 Corinthians. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. That though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor. So that you by his poverty might become rich. The greatest riches that we can have is Jesus Christ. It is that relationship with Jesus Christ that guarantees the riches of our heavenly inheritance, which is far greater than any elderly cruise ship and cruise trip can ever be. It is better, far better, than anything you could ever imagine. Those riches come through Christ. And notice what it said. He came poor for us. He gave up the glories of heaven for a while so that you might have that in here. So while going out and making a living, you can do that. While making sure you've got enough to live on in the future,
the goodness 